Children of the Most High We were never given a spirit of fear We've traded slavery for freedom We've been given love that has brought us new life We've traded rejection for adoption Abba, Father we are sons and daughters, Abba, Father. We are sons and daughters. We were never given a spirit of fear but of power and a sound mind we've been given love that has opened our eyes we are children of the most Never turning back, never turning back again. Whoa, living in your freedom. Never turning back, never turning back again. Whoa, living in your kingdom. Never turning back, never turning back again. Whoa, living in your freedom. Never turning back. Hi everyone, welcome. We're so glad to have you join us for church today. We hope that the songs that we sing and the message and the sense of community that you experience over the next few moments will make a personal impact in your life. And so again, thanks so much for joining us. We're going to get started right away.
service was amazing and I can't wait to see what he's going to do in this one as well. So Father, thank you so much for this day. We're so grateful for the opportunity that we have to come and meet with you, to worship, to hear your voice, to hear what's on your heart for us this morning. We love you. Be honored with our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
so hard to see It took me so long to believe it You choose someone like me To carry your victory Perfection could never earn it We give what we don't deserve
feeling, no matter what your experience says, God is for you, so who can be against you? So this morning, God, we just enter into that love. God, we enter into communion with you. You're so worthy. You're so good. You're so kind. So even just right now, just begin to lift your voice. Just begin to praise him. Just begin to adore him. Just begin to thank him with your own voice, with your own song. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Don't worry about who's next to you or who's in the room with you. Just give him praise. He's so worthy. We give you all we are, all we have, God. You're so good. You're so kind. You're so patient. Come on, lift your voice.
fear the storm Just because I hear it roar I don't want to fear the storm
critical decisions that need to be made, but Father, in the mundane, in the ordinary, God, I pray that we would be so sensitive to your leading, and out of that place, God, that we would experience your incredible peace, that we would be crowned with confidence, like we sang in worship today. Because we hear your voice, because we can be led by you, Father, Would we experience your peace this morning? Holy Spirit, would you speak to each one of us in this place this morning? We want to hear from you. We want to be led by you. We want to know what's on your heart. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Come on so good I just think it's incredible like what if we were so sensitive to the voice of the Lord that when he says turn we turn when he says wait we wait before you're seated this morning would you turn and wave at someone let them know that we see you that you're welcome here you want a big smile crinkly eyed smile and have a seat
love it. Such beautiful worship this morning, you guys. My name is Claire, and I am part of the team here at First Assembly, and I want to welcome you to church. (laughs) And if you are new here, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And if you are new and checking us out online, we're so glad that you guys have joined us. So if you are new, we want to get to know you. So there's a place that you can go online called Next Steps, and there's a little form that you can fill in, and a member of our team will reach out to you, get to know you, answer any questions that you might have. And we want to let you know that even though we're still in the midst of a pandemic with restrictions, there are still ways to experience community, and we don't want you guys to miss out on those opportunities. So feel free to fill that in and ask any questions that you might have about the church, and we'd love to be in touch with you. So this morning, as we continue in worship with our giving, with our tithes and offerings, we just want to thank you again, First Assembly, always, every week, thanking you because your partnership with us financially has enabled us to do so much for our community during this time, both locally and globally. And it's powerful. You don't always see it. You don't always meet the people that it's impacting, but your reach is great. And so we want to thank you for that. And so as you give this morning, there's different ways that you can do that. You can do that on your church center app on your phone. You can give in the foyer at guest services, or you can give on our website, www.fa.church. And there's an opportunity there as well. So this morning, there's a few announcements. And first of all, we have baby dedications coming up. And it's going to be a beautiful time, February 28th. So if you have a young, if you've got a baby that you would like to be dedicated, you can email us at info at fa.church and find out some more information. It'll be a beautiful time to celebrate the new lives that have joined us in this last, last little while. Also... If you are a parent in this place, there is a Zoom seminar. So an online seminar coming up February 24. Write that down if you're a parent. It's going to be a seminar on anxiety and depression. And I don't know about you guys, but... If I could reach out to the young people in my life with wisdom, with some equipping on how to talk about these subjects, how to encourage people, how to encourage them and um, speak life into, into the young people in my life regarding anxiety and depression and take away the stigma, take away the fear on these subjects, I want to encourage you guys to check this out and get equipped. And Pastor James has some more information on that. So if you're interested in it and want to know a little bit more, feel free to in email about him, or sorry, to him about that. So also, we have just sent out our tax receipts this past weekend, and so you should have, praise the Lord, and so if you haven't received them yet, please check your junk mail, or if you don't have your email on file with us, please stop by the front desk, and we would be happy to update that for you in our system. And so lastly, before Pastor James comes up to speak this morning, we'd only let you know that we've, in this last season, we've had some changes, some shifts. Our team has shifted a little bit. And so we don't want you guys to be out of the loop on that. And so in the last couple of weeks, we included an update in our What's Happening email. So please make sure to go and check that out. We want to let you guys know of the different changes that have been happening. So that's it. Would you welcome Pastor James to the stage with me this morning? Come on, let's give a big shout out to the amazing Claire Ifla. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Hey, you might notice a really handsome young man on stage with me right now. His name is Sebastian Martinez, and he is our junior high pastor. Let's give it up for Pastor Seb. Yeah. Come on. And we had a real special weekend here uh, at the church. Uh, Obviously, not a lot of people were here, but we had an online 403 Network Conference. And our first ever, it was the best we could do. But, Seb, what happened? What did God do there this weekend? Yeah, so 403 Conference happened. Maybe some of your students were there a part of it. Maybe, I know I saw some parents in the chat. They seemed more excited than some of the students about conference. It was amazing. So maybe you were there. But what happened is from this stage, we had the opportunity to broadcast to youth groups, to students all over our city, and just kind of share what Jesus is doing, be a part of a community. And it was absolutely amazing because 
the special part about everything that happened was that we realized as a community that God has no limitations, that even through a screen, his presence could move. And so the amazing part was over 200 students, leaders, youth groups registered. It was amazing. That's a, that's amazing for an online conference. We had students, let, let me tell you this. We had students from 7 a.m. to like 7 p.m. They're all day on a screen. I don't know how they did it, but man, God moved. For God. It was amazing. We even had a story, many stories like this actually, where one of the students kind of shared with us, hey, I came in, didn't really have any friends, struggling, don't really feel like I have family. And because of what happened at 403, because of you guys making this possible, I feel like God spoke to me and essentially saved me and saved my life. Come on. So, come on, that's worth raising. Come on, let's thank amazing. God for all he did this weekend. Yeah, so thank, thank you. you, Pastor Seb. Come on. come on. Amazing, thank you, team. You guys are amazing. Well, good morning, or rather good afternoon to everyone who's here with us in the room as well as online. As Claire mentioned, my name is James, and I have the honor and privilege of being uh, a servant here at this church. And uh, I, we are in a series called Seek First the Kingdom, and what we're talking about is spiritual disciplines, spiritual disciplines and how they can help us be formed into the truest version of ourselves, which hopefully our desire is to become more and more like Jesus as the time goes on. And I was assigned by Pastor Ben to teach on community as a spiritual discipline, on church, on the gathering of the saints and the followers of the way of Jesus that has been happening for over 2,000 years. So we're going to dive right in, and the title of my message is The Spiritual Discipline of Church. So I want to invite you to stand wherever you are for the reading of God's Word from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 to 25. Let's honor God's Word this morning. Verse 24 says this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for your church, your bride, each and every person here and at home and gathering all across our city, world, and nation, God. We thank you for the church, that its best days are yet ahead. God, that we have the privilege and opportunity to be a part of your vehicle and conduit of bringing your good news here to our hurting world. So God, we thank you for the church, and would you teach us something more about it today? In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. So what I want to look at this afternoon is why we as Christ followers, if you call yourself that, have a dire need to practice the spiritual discipline of church. Now, some of us, we may be thinking like, church? Spiritual discipline? Like, really? And, and I'm here to tell you, it is a spiritual discipline. It's just like prayer or fasting or silence and solitude or generosity, the things that we already talked about. All of these are spiritual disciplines, and so is church. Because you getting up in minus whatever it is out there right now, I got up in minus 28 degrees to have to scrape my window, warm my car up, and make my way to the church. Let me tell you this, it's a spiritual discipline. I needed the spirit to get out of my bed this morning. I was up at 4 a.m., couldn't sleep. I needed the Lord to give me some energy. It's a spiritual discipline. And I would go as far to say that it's the most important spiritual discipline of them all. Why? Because here is where, for again over 2,000 years, the church has been learning about the other spiritual disciplines. The gathering of the saints has been the primary place for spiritual development. So I'll say it again, the church, church gathering, I believe, is the most spiritual discipline. And it's a bold statement, I know. But my, by, my hope is, by the end of this talk, that you are more convinced about being a part of the church and the need to do it. And not just the universal church, but the local church that is life-giving and helps lead you to the feet of Jesus every time you gather. But before I get into this talk, I have three prefaces that I hope will give you a better understanding of the heart of this message. And the first is this. I want you to know that I know, and every church leader knows, that this has been probably one of the hardest years 
in the world's history or the church's history for Christians to gather. It's complicated. Masks, social distancing, we're a fraction of what we once were in this building. When's that gonna come back? Who knows? It's, it, it's been complicated. It's been hard. And, 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 and it's easy just to, you know, instead of like, I don't wanna deal with that. I'll, you know, like, I'm just gonna stay at home. And because and, 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 I don't know about you, but I am sick of the masks. I'm sick of being at home. And right off the top, I want you to know that this message is not to condemn or guilt, or shame. We've locked the doors on guilt and shame. They're not allowed in, but it is only to reaffirm and teach our convictions of why practicing the spiritual discipline of church is vital. But it's been hard. I'll say that up front. The second preface is this. I know that if you're here or watching at home, that chances are you may not need this message. Or maybe you don't think you need this message. And why do I think that? Well, it's because you're here. You showed up in minus 25. You obviously value church. I'm guessing that you love your community. You believe in the cause of the local church on here on, on earth. But you may be thinking in this moment like, oh, another message on church, James? Come on, man. I've heard this before. I love church. It's great. Music, the goosebumps, the subpar church coffee we used to drink. They don't serve anymore. I love it. It's amazing. I don't need this message. Well, first of all, church is a lot more than that. If you want to know what we here at First Assembly believe what church is, go back to our Back to the Basics series we preached this past summer. But if you are in that place and you're kind of having that initial thought by my introduction about what we're talking about, my preface to you is now more than ever, we need an even more rock solid and firm ecclesiology. And the word ecclesiology comes from the root word ecclesia, which means the assembly of the called out ones. It's where we get our modern day word church. And ecclesiology is just a fancy term for the doctrine of the church. But why I believe we need a greater understanding of church is over the past few decades, if you haven't noticed, church has been under fire. It's on the hot seat. It's had enormous amounts of criticism, and it always has been. It's always had, I suppose, enemies, because we have a real enemy. But it always will be. It's been under fire, and if statistics show anything, is that in Canada, our church participation across our nation dwindles year by year as we go on. Blame for a turnaround. But I believe there are many reasons for that, and the primary reason for that is I would like to propose to you is that the enemy would like nothing more than to lead people away from being a part of a local church or family. Why is that, you ask? Well, it's simple. It says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that the enemy is prowling like a lion seeking for whom he can devour. And the easiest way for a lion to kill, if you've ever watched National Geographic, it's really simple. The, the lion or the predator will wait until the animal their prey is alone. And the enemy would love to get you alone into isolation, which is what we've all been dealing with because he knows you're most vulnerable when you're alone. And that is why we must have a rational and well thought out doctrine of the church in our life because if we don't, it will be incredibly easy for us to either neglect like they were in Hebrews 10 or not prioritize and fall away from the community of believers. And what I'm saying is not meant to like scare you out of not coming to church or just make you swallow all the words I'm about to say, but no, 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 no. I, I want each and every one of us to chew on them and for you to truly figure out why you, not me, not your parents if you're a student in here, not your pastors, but why you are a part of the church and practice it as a spiritual discipline because Lord knows it takes some discipline to show up sometimes, amen? amen? And maybe you're agreeing with me. You feel like it is a discipline and perhaps not a passion right now in your life. And it could be for many different reasons, but maybe perhaps it's for my third preface and the reason in which I deeply wish I didn't have to preface this message before I get into it. Because as I preach a message for the church and why it's important, I fully recognize that if we're honest, the church has had its ups and downs in history. Some great moments, 
some plain old evil moments, which has led to many leaving the church for reasons like from the inception of church, hear about all the corrections and conspiracies and things wrong that the, that the apostles were calling the church out. And go, go read 1 Corinthians 7. Some messed up stuff goes, what was going on in that church. Or maybe Jesus rebukes for the churches and revelations that 90 years later if the church started, he was already correcting them, saying, where you have lost your first love or the other rebukes, the beginning of Revelation. Maybe it's for some doctrine and maybe some poor teaching that has pushed you away, like, ah, I can't agree with that. And maybe it's not necessarily what was being taught, but how it was being taught. And the realization of maybe how dysfunctional the church was then and is now to, to things like in our history, like the Crusades and all the people that were killed in the name of Jesus. To the later medieval ages, priests wielding their power over peasants. To Christian slave owners in the 18th and 19th century. To many German priests and pastors conforming to the gospel of Hitler and not Jesus Christ, minus Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his buddies. To D.F. Milan, who, was a, who went to seminary to get his doctrine in divinity, who was a Dutch Reformed pastor, then became the prime minister of South Africa and was the man who implemented the diabolic system of apartheid. To the darkest parts of colonialism or reserves and residential schools that the Roman Catholic and Anglican Church took part of in Canada's early history, to money-hungry televangelists in the 70s and the 80s, to the scandals in church leadership in the 90s and to the present, to now today, pastors and prophets prophesying that Donald Trump is God's man and he's going to get into office. But then look what happened. They wielded their platform. And I'm not saying you can't get a prophetic word wrong, but they wielded it to influence for somebody that, well, didn't happen. And to say the least, because I'm not here to preach on the failures of the church, but before I make a case for why church as a spiritual discipline is important, I have to be honest and recognize that our history has had some pretty embarrassing and evil moments. To where Gandhi coined the saying and spoke truth when he said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians because the Christians are nothing like their Christ. And see, in an honest moment, you may be here and listening to this or online or listen to this some other time, and perhaps you've been hurt by the church. Maybe you've had a poor experience with church, or a leader at church, or you know, kids volunteer, or the hip youth pastor, or, or leaders, pastors, elders. I know there are the gamut of stories out there of abuse, emotionally, sexually, mentally, manipulation, fear-mongering, exclusivity to other races and sexes, poor financial management, nepotism, misuse of power. We could go down the list of mistakes and failures that the church has made. And I'm here to say at the end of this preface that sadly, I'm a part of a fraternity of some healthy but also some really messed up leaders. That whether I like it or not, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ and a part of my family. And that if you call First Assembly your home church, you are a part of a church that is certainly not perfect. And you may have wondered why over the years, and well, this is not a cop-out answer, but a true one, and the reason is we are all broken. We're all in process. Even your pastors are broken. We're all broken, we're all flawed, and I wish to God that in his sovereignty, he wouldn't use dummies like me or some of the poor leaders throughout history. But for some mysterious reason, God still uses to choose broken people all throughout the scripture. From Abraham to David, from Paul to Peter, and now today in me. God has and will still choose to use broken people. And do I have an answer for why that is? No. Apart from, you wouldn't have anybody else to use because we're all broken. But I'll say this as I transition you know, my thoughts on church as a spiritual discipline. And this message, again, you may be sitting there thinking, ah, it's not for me, but maybe it's not. Because this message, by and large, is for the people in the back or on the fringes of church or have maybe even left the church. And we all know people that have left the church. We all know, we all have them. So if you're listening or you're listening on behalf of somebody else and you've been hurt or broken or disappointed by the church, I genuinely and am deeply sorry. 
And I know that an apology on behalf of the church is probably not enough to heal those wounds because Lord knows I have wounds from the church too and they hurt, they run deep. Man, y'all thought daddy issues are bad? Try somebody who's bitter at the church. Man, there's some church issues that are bad out there. It's hard, it's intense. But still, for what it's worth, I want to apologize and ask for any and everyone's forgiveness on behalf of the wrongs the church may have done to you that has caused you for, to forsake or neglect the gathering of the saints. And if you can find it in your heart to forgive that person, and maybe it's me, or go and make reconciliation with that pastor, church, or leader, I would encourage you to do so because hurt, bitterness, resentment is a classic wedge the enemy uses to separate you from God and his family. And believe me when I say this, you may be thinking, ah, it's not that big of a deal, but it may just be a little bit of hurt. But as my mama said, she said, you give the devil your finger, he'll take your whole hand. And my mom doesn't sound like that, but don't let the enemy drive a wedge between you and your brothers and sisters here at church. So if you'll accept this apology and let it be a propellant to go make things right or forgive someone, I think it might be worth your while. So that was a mouthful. A lot of prefaces that really get to what I'm trying to get at. But I believe it all needed to be said in order to say, which what I'm about to say next is, flaws and all, I love church. Does anybody love church? Okay, 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 okay. I wasn't sure. You know, it was pretty heavy at the front. but We love church. Why? Because you're the church. It's not this building, 6031 Elba Drive Southwest. Say the address again. You, want, you need me to repeat the address? Oh, the ad, the bill, the, the, what do you want me to say, Ralph? You want to come say? We are the church. We are the church, somebody. It's not a building. It's our family. It's a gathering. And it's not just once a week on Sunday, but it is a living, breathing, moving organism of people that are committed to following Jesus. And I am not ashamed of being a part of the church, even with all its broken parts. But still, you may be like, James, like, are you sure you still like practicing the spiritual discipline of the church? Well, today, to be honest, I didn't because it was really cold. I wanted to stay in bed. and I was up early, but... The answer that I have to say with eyes wide open is yes, I still value with all my heart practicing this discipline because like marriage, my wife, the longer she knows me, the more she sees my weaknesses. But the longer she's with me and I'm with her because we love each other and we commit it to each other, which is not a hot word these days, we sharpen each other like Proverbs says in chapter 27, verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And that, my friends, is what church does for you and me. Being a part of a community that is incredibly diverse sharpens you. Why? To ultimately help you become more like Jesus. And yes, some days it's through its flaws that push you to the brink, but also through its strengths that build you up. And like our primary text in Hebrews we just read says, through motivation, love, and good works, to never give up on loving and becoming more like Jesus. Why? Because his return is soon. But still, I know there's skeptics in here. Some may not be convinced so I want to give you five reasons what church has done for me. And when I say this, I'm not saying like, hey, man, this is what church has done for me. It's legit. No, no, I'm not talking about consumerism. I'm talking about when you lay your life down and you invest into the church and you give yourself to the community, serving its needs and loving people, it gives you way much more in return. Because as the saying goes, you only get what out, you only get out of what, well, I don't know what's the saying. You reap what you sow, whatever. You know what I'm saying. So five reasons why practicing this spiritual discipline and sticking with it will radically shape your life to the betterment of you and others around you. First, if you're taking notes, when you practice the spiritual discipline of gathering with the saints, you become a part of the greatest community on earth. There has never been a greater community that is more inclusive than the church. No family, no club, no group, no religion, no nothing. Nothing has been more inclusive and a greater community than Christianity. It gathers across all of the globe. 
weekly in the majority of every country, town, region, village, hamlet on the planet. And now some may say, James, come on, man, it's not inclusive, like it's judgmental, it's extremely conservative of who it lets in, but I beg to differ. First off, the universal Big C Church and even our church is made up of people from vastly different socioeconomic classes. From the impoverished poor to the middle class to the insanely rich, there are all of these people in our church and around the world. It's also made up of people from different ethnicities, ages, genders, but more than that, it also has people that it's made up of people from different history or backgrounds. We have both sinner and saint in our family. And although some churches may be better at welcoming and actually proving with their actions what they mean when they say, come as you are, or you belong before you believe, still, in the universal church, and I would say our church, and in God's kingdom, everyone is welcomed, and Jesus modeled that. Think of the motley crew that Jesus had of disciples that were completely on different ends of the spectrum. See, being a part of this community, what it does is it gives you an identity and a purpose that's greater than yourself. It propels you forward to be a part of the great commission that is the renewal of the world and salvation to all those who believe into God's family. Not just, oh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but his family here on earth. Second, when you practice this spiritual discipline, you inherit a family who loves you no matter what. See, church is the most committed group of people to each other no matter what. John Tyson puts it this way. He says, Christian community is a web of stubbornly loyal relationships knotted together in a living network of persons who are committed to practicing the way of Jesus together for the renewal of the world. I'll say this. Church has more commitment to each other, more than scouts, more than gangs, more than choirs, more than cults, more than karate dojos, more than the military, heck, more than CrossFit gyms, for crying out loud. Those people are crazy about each other. <laughs> Quick joke, how do you know somebody is a part of a CrossFit gym? They'll tell you. Thank you, Cody. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, they're crazy about it. They're, we should be like CrossFit gyms. <laughs> hey, what'd you do this weekend? I went to church. I'm just kidding. But anyways, well, am I kidding? I don't know. But the point is, is that the church is a committed group of people to each other and proud of it. And the church has had a history of not giving up on the worst of people and continually pursuing the most evil people out there. Why? So that they can welcome them into their family and tell them that they're loved by God so that God can do what he does best in transforming their life. And although there can be a fair amount of infighting or backstabbing or gossip or whatever in the church, I have still seen the worst situations restored. From marital affairs forgiven, church splits recovered, dysfunctional families mended, the best friendships that were broken to heal, to enemies becoming friends in the church. See, the church at its best is built on covenant relationships with each other, and it says, you're my family, and I love you, and you're accepted, and you're forgiven, no matter what you do. And again, we're not, perf we're not perfect in it, but in comparison to any other place or organization, we hands down are the best at being a family. And this is the one thing that we have on the rest of the world. When it comes to community, I'm confident in saying that the church is the best. And with this practice, you gain a global family who loves you no matter what and helps you grow in every season from cradle to grave. No other system, no other organization, not even Sweden has this kind of cradle to grave care for someone like the church does. Third, by practicing this discipline, you become a part and participate with the biggest humanitarian not-for-profit organization on the planet. Here's a quote from Tom Morris, the pastor who started Tehillah in 1991. He said this about the church, and I quote, we're the only organization on the planet that exists for the benefit of its non-members. I believe that's true. Why are we here? So that we can get encouraged, so that we can go out into the world and love on people that aren't a part of this church. That's why we're here. If that's not why you're here, well, we got some thinking to do. And we'll do that at the end, but 
Our whole goal is to go and love people outside of these walls. And the church, if you study it throughout history, has done that. It has been the pioneer of the majority of humanitarian efforts, organizations, and movements. If you've ever wondered where the orphanage originated, it's from the church in the fourth century. Because they were instructed by the Apostle James that pure religion is the care for the widows and the orphans. And before that, it was common practice for Christians to adopt orphans into their family. How about hospitals? History shows that it was the church in first century AD that took care of the sick and the weak and the vulnerable. When nobody else, the Roman government certainly didn't want to take care of people. And by the fourth century, it was the newly converted Roman Christians that developed homes for the sick. How about education? The majority of Ivy League universities and schools in the states and around the world, they were formed by Christians saying, we need to educate people. And yes, the secular world has maybe perhaps taken over most of those universities and what's being taught in is not what its roots were by any means. But still, it was the church that started many educational institutions. How about equality? Social justice? Serving to the marginalized and disenfranchised food banks, addiction recovery centers like the Dream Center, international humanitarian work, houseless aid and shelters. It was the church that was championing these causes long before anyone else in history. And the world's making it popular now, social justice, but no, 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 no. The church started that. The church did. And we haven't been perfect in them. But our history still proves to be one filled holistically with people full of compassion and mercy and living for the betterment of others. It's the most generous organization this world has ever seen. 2.4 billion Christians, they say. Imagine everybody gave a dollar a year. And there's obviously more. Some people give nothing. Some people give less than that. Some people give way more than that. But the amount of money that's poured into missions and serving people in our local communities, I don't know any other organization that spends more on on people. And being a part of it, if you let it, will help help propel you to become generous and activated and becoming the greatest servant of all, which is the pinnacle of the kingdom in the Christian life, is to become, want to become the greatest of all, become the greatest servant of all through loving our world. Fourthly, when you commit to and practice the spiritual discipline of gathering with the saints, you develop your inner and outer being. No other place on the planet develops character and morality like the church does. Scouts and girl guides can have, you know, they can teach you a few things. Sports can help. Schools and educators do have a part to play, certainly. But in our country, whether you want to admit it or not, or our Western society, the majority of laws, even if you go read Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, most of it was founded upon Judeo-Christian principles. Man, for the whole world. After, you know, number four in the Ten Commandments, that's still a legitimate framework that the world thinks through. Do not murder, do not lie, do not steal, you know, you know them. It's still a relevant framework for morality to this day. But more than just morality in the church, what it does is it develops character in you like nothing else. Purity of heart, integrity, service, honor, respect. These are all core values to what it means to be a follower of Christ. But it gets even better than that. Can you believe it? It's crazy. Not only does the church develop your inner being and character and morality, how about leadership development? How about musical skills, technical skills, the arts, educators, public speakers, you name it. Millions of people got their start in church, and it helped them discover who they are and what they were made to do. I mean, go down the list of artists, actors, musicians, social influencers, from Justin Bieber to Ja Rule, from Denzel to Katy Perry, from Malcolm X to Martin Luther King, who were both two pastor's kids. All and more of these people got their start and first shot in developing their gifts within their church community. And this is why First Assembly believes and does weekends like this, even when we could have easily just not done anything, people wouldn't have noticed. It's because we believe in the next generation. We have a saying in our youth ministry that goes, we are investing into every student like they're going to become the next prime minister, person of influence, or professional athlete because we just never know what God will do through a person's life And our job is to see the potential in them and pull it out. 
A lot of the people we just listed, they were all babies that soiled the diaper too, and then yet God placed a gift on their life, and the church helped pull it out. See, when you're a part of the church, your insides with character, morality, integrity will be grown like a plant in a greenhouse if you embrace it and let it. And also, outside talent can and will be developed. But fifthly, and most importantly, when you practice this spiritual discipline, you will experience the living God. It has been the place for two millennia where the fire of God has descended upon its people in a gathering. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. The church, the ecclesia, the gathering of the saints, it has been the primary place where God's presence has shown up throughout history. Where people gather in his name, he reveals himself. And this is not to say he doesn't when you're alone because some of my most powerful and rich encounters when it was just me and God in the secret place. But my God, church, it's where the spirit of God has fallen time, time, and time again, even with all our faults and mistakes. He doesn't give up on us. He still pours his spirit out. Now, I believe there is going to be a day because usually in history as we study it, Revival comes after it gets really dark, and I don't know if you noticed, but we're probably primed and ready for it. But he's poured his spirit out on his family. Every Sunday, millions of churches across the globe where people come together and lives are changed. The sick are healed, the broken are restored, marriages, relationships, families are mended, where the lost become found, the spiritually hungry are fed, the thirsty souls are given something to drink. And why is this? Why does God choose to make it the gathering of the saints, one of his primary places he reveals himself? I don't entirely know. But the thought that I submit is that a father oftentimes is most pleased when he has his kids at one table, when his, his, his babies, his children, or under one roof, or in one area, and he seems to just delight in that moment like he is looking down on us now. And I could spend hours, and I know you could too, talking about the amount of meetings that you've been in where signs, wonders, and miracles were poured out. People, I'm, I know you've seen at church where people have been on their knees under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, where, where the Spirit was working on the hardest hearts from people in the back, angry and bitter and jaded and shut off to God. But then by the end of the meeting, they're at the front, weeping at the altar in love with God, that God softened their heart in a matter of minutes. I know many of us could say we have encountered the living presence of God when we practice the spiritual discipline of gathering with God's family. It happens every time we gather. So to recap, when we practice this, we, won, gain the greatest, yet flawed, yes, I know, but still greatest community on earth. We, too, gain a family that never gives up on us and pulls the best out of us that is for the betterment of each other. We, three, become a part of the greatest not-for-profit serving movement the planet has ever seen. We, four, have the opportunity to develop our insides our heart, our character, our worldview, and moral compass, but more than that, also our outside talents and skills, from arts to leadership to people skills and many more. But lastly, and again, I say most importantly, when we come to a central gathering point where people are there to solely experience God, we do. We do. And that's how church impacts your life when you commit to practicing it, which is why I don't give up on the church, even with all its flaws. Because no other place will give me a community and friendship that's sharpened me like the church does. No other place gives me people in my life that don't give up on me on my weakest moments, and there's been many. No other place has helped me grasp the heart of serving the poor and the marginalized like the Church does. No other place has taught me generosity like church has. No other place develops me inside and out. And I have found no other religion, no other temple, no other idol, no other lowercase g God that supernaturally moves every time we meet like I do when I am at church, when you are at church, when we are together. So now, 
The question I have for all of us in closing is with all church's purpose and benefits and things it adds to our life by practicing that as a spiritual, as practicing it as a spiritual discipline. Why is the church then, in some sense, losing that value? You know, it was happening in Hebrews 10. The author wrote to these people, do not neglect meeting together. And again, I know, remember my prefaces. I understand it is complicated right now. So no shame, no guilt. But still, church decline was happening long before COVID ever came. COVID just accelerated it. It's way easier to leave church when nobody knows. Nobody's texting you because, oh, we just assume they're watching it at home. And when I say church as a whole, I'm not going after you guys, you gals. I'm not, I'm not going after First Assembly. What, what I'm going after is church as a whole. You know, why is participation, the participation rate slipping to an average of once every six weeks for church attendees in Canada? You know, I'm asking these questions. Why is this the discipleship of our young in the home being something that is put on the back burner and priority list all the way at the bottom for our, because of our fast-paced Calgarian life? Why is that? Why is the rate of church shopping, consumerism, and low commitment even a reality in the church? Man, why are millennials and Gen Zs leaving the church in droves? Why? And listen, I've heard a lot of reasons, if not all of them. I've heard of them. the preaching isn't good, man. And here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you can't go to another church and find a community that works for you. Or rather, let me just say this. If you're going to ever shop for a church, ask God, where do you want me to plant? Don't just go, where is the convenient place for me? God, where do you want me to sow? Where do you want me to plant? But I've heard the reasons. Oh, the preaching isn't good. Maybe some of you are going home after today and saying, man, that young whippersnapper, man, he needs to check himself at the door. His doctrine is off. You know, like maybe oh, the preaching isn't good. Or maybe oh, the community isn't great. And I've heard that about First Assembly many times. The amount of times I've heard people come in and say, nobody said hi to me. And maybe it's just the nature of our building. We have nine entrances and exits. But maybe it's something we can improve in. I've heard that all oh, the style of worship could be different. I've heard, oh, there's no anointing at that church. I've heard, oh, they don't understand me. And I've heard many times. And I sympathize and empathize with every single one of these people that say, I've been hurt by the church. I've also heard, I'm too busy. And it blows my mind how church can become priority 17 on the list of many people's lives, yet they still call themselves a follower of Christ. It amazes me. It blows my mind. And why does it boggle my mind? Because in the Old Testament and New Testament, if you were God's people, you were committed to God's family. But now, you can just come and go as we please to what entertains us the most. And when it gets hard, we just slip away as many have in COVID. And I get it, we all have our reasons. But when we read the scripture and find out that Jesus paid the ultimate price, for who? His church. That he laid down his life so that his church, his bride could flourish. When we read that, it boggles my mind that people would ever walk out on it, no matter how hard the circumstance. He built his church so that we could become all he intended us to be. He died. He died on that cross so that we could have life and life abundantly here in this life and the next. And the only common denominator between this life and the next is people. Nothing else comes to heaven with us. This building is going to burn one day. The only thing that comes is you. I pray this building doesn't burn down. I really like it, but. Just kidding, it's not gonna burn, hopefully. There could be a fire. We almost had a fire several years ago. Anyways, I digress. So my question is, why on earth would we as the church ever forsake or neglect the primary thing that the Holy Spirit partners with to keep us on the journey of faith? 
And am I saying you can't follow God if you don't go to church? No, I'm not saying that. Of course you can. But am I saying without the people of God in your regular life, will you be stifled in your growth towards Christ? Absolutely. I never in my life have ever seen someone leave a local community of believers and then fall in love more with Jesus. I've never seen someone leave the church altogether and say, I love Jesus way more now that I'm out at First Assembly. Man, that place was toxic. Never seen anybody fall in love more with Jesus when they leave. And I'm, I'm guessing it's the same for you. I'm guessing it's the same for you. And the call, the question that I have for us this morning, this afternoon, is what does church mean to you? What does it mean to you? I know it's not a perfect system. I know that. But it's what God gave us. And I want each and every one of us to, again, gain a more robust doctrine of the church so that we know why we do this. That we're not just pretending either while we're here or we're not just on autopilot while we're here. Or we're not just as soon as, you know, the chorus goes, our hands go up while we're here. Or we're not just hanging out and just doing our thing. No, no, no. I want us to know why we are a part of the church. Because when you just glaze over when you walk in these doors, you're not actually getting the fullness of what God designed the church to be. The iron sharpening iron. And God never said this life would be easy. But he did give us a family to journey with. So what does it mean to you? Why do you believe in church? Why are you a part of it? And if you aren't a part of it and you're watching online, that's completely okay. We're all on a journey. But then my question to you is, what is God saying to you about his church in this moment? And no matter what place you're in, whether you've been going to church for 60 years or you don't know Jesus at all and you're sitting in this room, I want all of us to wrestle with this. I want us to wrestle with this. Because the more we believe in it, the more the church actually becomes what it was called to be, his bride without spot or wrinkle that Jesus is coming back for, his church, his family, his kids. To take a moment, ask the Lord as the band plays in the back, why church, God? And only you can answer this for yourself. These words may have helped, but I know they're not gonna answer it for you. You gotta answer it yourself. Every teenager in here, ask yourself this question. Please, I beg you. Why do I go to church with my parents? Why? Why do I follow this God? Why do I practice the thing that he gave me? Why? Take a moment. Why do I believe in this thing, God? Why do I commit to it? Why do I give to it? Father, we come to you humbly and pray, God, that you would reveal to each and every one of us the importance of your church, the importance of a community. God, we pray right now that in the only way that you can do, God, not these words, but by your spirit, God, that you would highlight things that maybe perhaps we've been taking for granted or maybe not sowing into or maybe not being obedient to you and leading, being led by your spirit. Like, Lord, maybe, maybe we've just been attending. Maybe we've just been spectating. And God, you're calling us to get in the game, get off the bench and start participating. God, maybe you're calling each and every one of us to be in a community that actually knows our names, knows our struggles, knows what's the best parts and the worst parts of us and still loves us. In a community group, God. God, maybe you're calling us to actually contribute. God, God, to our tithes and offerings and so into what God is doing through this community because maybe we've been sitting there and saying, nah, nah, I'm good. I don't want to sow. God, maybe it may be things like serving and being a part of the, the FA Cares movement or, or whatever other missional things, God, that any church does 
that people are part of if they're watching online or here that our church does. God, what is it, God, that you are calling me into, that the Spirit is leading me into, to continue on the journey of practicing this spiritual discipline in a more full way, God? What is it? Why church, God? Why did you create this? God, speak to our hearts as we continue to sing. I invite you guys to stand. Father, I just declare restoration this morning. Father, for those that have been hurt, for those that have been wounded, I declare restoration, just a reconnection with you, God the Father, and with community again. Father, I pray that you would cast your vision for the church, for each one of us in this place, that we would catch your heart again for church, that we would catch your vision for church, Father, that we would see people like you see people, that we would see people through your lens of love. God, the potential, the vision that you have placed over every person's life. God, by your grace, I pray that we would see people's potential as they walk through the doors, that we would speak life into each other, that we would encourage each other. I thank you, Father, for the church. Thank you so much, Father, that you have been busy with your church and you, you are not done with us yet. God, that you are taking us from strength to strength to strength. God, that we would be known as a place of encounter with you, that the church would be known as a place of hope, of healing, of reconciliation, and a place to meet with you. God, would you let it be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Have an amazing week, you guys. You're all amazing. We love you. If you're picking up kids, you can do that in the gym. And if you're meeting with youth, you can do that in the foyer with the youth leaders. They'll be there. We will see you guys next Sunday. Be blessed.
Thank you so much for joining us for church today. We're so glad that you could be a part online with us. If you've not yet made a personal decision in your life to follow Jesus, to make him the Lord and the Savior of your life, and you feel God drawing you today to him, I would love to invite you to pray with me, even right now where you are. Just pray something like this from your heart. Jesus, here I am. God, I need you in my life. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross for me. I invite you into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin and my failure. Today, I choose to make you the leader of my life, the Lord of my life. I ask you to come in, change me. In Jesus' name. You know, if you prayed that prayer today, the Bible says that you were born again. You're a new creature. You're a new person. You're not the person you used to be. It's a miracle. It's supernatural. And so we want to, as a church community, help you take your next step. And if you want to go to the website, you will see even the links right there where you're watching. It says next steps. We'd love to get you a Bible, help you plug in further with others who are on a journey of faith just like you and help you follow Jesus. Thanks so much for joining us today. God bless.